Hello, my name is Valentine Cadieux. I'm the current director of Hamlin University's Center for Justice and Law, and I've been asked by the student coordinator team to describe a little bit what we mean when we talk about environmental justice, which is the current theme of the Center for Justice and Law. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we live and work on Ojibwe and Dakota land, and it's an important place to start our discussion of environmental justice because a large part of the environmental justice movement has come out of learning from our indigenous neighbors, the original and continuing inhabitants of this land, how to have a relationship with land that can go on for a really long time without making it an uninhabitable place, which is something that settler colonialism has not done well. So part of a base part of environmental justice is learning how to be better neighbors with each other and with the land we live with. Environmental justice is also described as environmental racism or environmental inequality. The Un United States Environmental Protection Agency defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Although these terms, environmental justice, environmental racism, and environmental inequality came into popular use in the 1980s, this was a movement that really had come from the longer term understanding of what it takes to live in a place as had been done for many centuries, many millennia by people of the land. In the 1980s, this came to prominence over black led activism around the dumping of contaminants, particularly in North Carolina was where this, this movement came to national prominence. But during this time, people shared an emerging understanding of the racial segregation in the history of where both extractive mining and pollution of contaminants and the dumping of contaminants occurred, predominantly in places where people of color had been relegated to live by discriminatory lending practices, zoning practices, and other ways of city building and segregation of access to power and privilege. Around this time, between the 80s and the 90s, and coming out of work in the civil rights movement and the decolonial movements, there was an international formalization of environmental justice. It's often associated with the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in 1991 in the United States, held in Washington, D.C. And this was attended by folks from all over the United States, from every United State, from Mexico, Chile, and many other countries. And at this meeting, 17 principles of environmental justice were adopted and circulated in the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio. So the Rio principles in the Declaration of Environment and Development describes a lot of the ways that the environmental justice movement has continued to operate. This was also adopted in global climate justice at this point. And a lot of the topics that were described have moved into environmental economics as well. So concepts like ecological debt climate justice, food sovereignty, corporate accountability, and even ideas like environmental sacrifice zones, places that we've decided it's okay to give up on, or global green zones, places that of escape for those who have wealth and privilege. And it's the idea that we should not have sacrifice zones and global green zones, that we should continue to have a world in which no one needs, needs to live in proximity to something that will make their health suffer or where the earth itself and the, the earth processes that we rely on for our nourishment and home won't be able to continue to regenerate themselves. It's clearly not a way that we're going to be able to live here in the long term. Despite this history of advocacy, when we hear the words environmental justice, especially in the context of the law, we often think of environmentalism, and particularly, I think, of a legacy of legal, legal advocacy related not only to the toxins that this environmental justice movement was originally focused on, but also a move toward national parks and green space, things that really did benefit mostly the wealthy. So people often have 
some resistances to this particular brand of environmentalism. And I think it's really important that we ground our understanding of environmental justice in the inter intersection of our society's tolerance for continuing to make environments unsafe and unhealthy and to make the question of who gets to avoid these places and who has to live with them into a market proposition. So the idea that only if you can afford to live in a nice place is that something that you are able to access is one of our fundamentally unjust ways of making environmental decisions for our society. And this turns us squarely into our leg legacy of colonialism and its accompanying hierarchies, which are intersectional in many ways of distancing some people further away from power, privilege, and healthy environments. Notably, it's really important to note how the legacy has left us with confusing ways of understanding environmental relationships. We hold indigenous people in high regard for their environmental ideals and our settler governments fight indigenous people in court to continue extractive mining and reinforcing economies that only work on the principles of growth and further extraction and exploitation. So as an academic, I was trained as a geographer and political ecologist, as well as a community artist. I've spent my career in this effort to build mechanisms of repair and transformation. I think it's important for us to understand and learn about environmental justice in ways that keep in sight these large structures and tendencies our society and economies encourage, while at the same time focusing the bulk of our efforts, amplifying the efforts of those who are already living in mutual and reciprocal economies, repairing social and ecological systems, and working in solidarity to push back on toxics to retain a healthy and regenerative economy that's not a threat to the world, an effort that takes a lot of collaboration for trying and learning and trying again, incorporating the necessary processes for healing from the bruises we inflict on each other and the efforts along the way. I owe a lot to economic, racial, and environmental justice organizer, Dominique Diago Cash, who came to campus this week and just helped our class on environments, justice, and well being, along with William Moore, uh, organizer and county government leader in public health to understand the basic premises of reparation and how we take down what needs to be changed and live into the world we want, one that has environmental justice that will hopefully allow us to stay here for quite a long time. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you come to a lot of our Center for Justice and Law events. And for those you miss, they're on our YouTube channel and we hope that you share them with your communities, find them useful and let us know what else you'd like to know and learn and build into the future of an environmentally just society.